Hey, Rob Fitzgerald here again. Thanks for tuning in. Um, before we get started, I wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, our clinical chemists and our lab director, our pathologist lab directors. Um, let you know that uh, many clinical labs, ours for example, we, we report out about four million chemistry tests a year and most of them are boring. Um, we are interested in hearing from our clinicians and from pharmacists, uh, other people that use the lab. If you have questions about your labs, reach out to your lab directors and, and see if they can be helpful. You know, we're certainly interested in these and, and, and in particular the endocrine tests are, are, are often challenging to interpret and there's, there's many different varieties of, of endocrine tests and so uh, certainly glad to work with you to uh, try to get the best information that's possible. Um, I've got about 12 slides talking about uh, ACTH and dexamethasone suppression tests, so this is related to our, our cortisol lectures. And uh, ACTH uh, is released uh, as we, we talked about cortisol. Um, it is a stimulus for cortisol release and it comes in burst. And so it has a dineural variation. It's the highest in, in, the, in the early morning, so somewhere around 8 o'clock. Um, is where the highest concentrations of ACTH are. Um, it has a very short half-life, so ACTH sort of comes out in burst, um, and it's causing cortisol to rise in that dineural pattern. You know, the half-life of cortisol is a lot longer, so we don't see the major fluctuations in, in cortisol that we do in, uh, in ACTH, um, because cortisol has a half-life of about 65 minutes. Um, so, as we said, you know, the ACTH is jumping up and down and the cortisol is sort of an integrated response of that. It's the highest in the morning and it drops by about half in the, in the evening. Um, so ACTH is a, is a polypeptide and um, it would be very useful and it, it can be a very useful test. The problem is, is that it's difficult to get the samples collected properly. Um, there are peptidases that are chewing it up. The, it's typically done by an immunoassay, and sometimes the immunoassay will react with the intact molecule as well as fragments, and so the, the measurement is analytically challenging. And so um, if it is done properly, it can be interpreted, but we need to take special steps in, you know, including enzyme inhibitors, collecting the sample on ice, getting it centrifuged and frozen rapidly, and, and certainly we can do that. Um, but it, it is difficult, and those pre-analytical variables, we need to work together to make sure that we have those under control in order to be able to interpret an ACTH properly. Um, so as I said, it's very unstable in blood samples. Um, what it's useful for is differentiating primary from secondary insufficiency. So, and we're talking about hypocortisolism, so a, a deficiency in cortisol. We want to know, is that at the adrenal gland, or is that at the pituitary, or is that at the hypothalamus? And so in the cases of a primary insufficiency, um, you're going to have not enough uh, cortisol, and so that cortisol is not feeding back very well, and your ACTH would be high. Um, in a secondary insufficiency, the problem is at the pituitary, not stimulating the adrenal gland. So in that case, your ACTH is going to be low. That's, that's the problem, and that's why you don't have enough cortisol. can also be useful in, in, in looking at Cushing syndrome. So primary adrenal, uh, sorry, uh, uh, right, a pituitary adenoma that is really defined as Cushing's disease, or an ectopic, that's where you have a, a carcinoma maybe in the lung that's producing ACTH, both of those are driving the excess cortisol. And so in that case, ACTH is going to be high. If you have an adrenal adenoma or carcinoma that's secreting cortisol, that cortisol is going to negatively feed back on the hypothalamus and pituitary and your ACTH would be low. Um, in the diagnosis of a congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and that's a genetic deficiency where you don't have the enzymes required to synthesize cortisol, if you have no cortisol, you have no negative feedback, and your ACTH is going to be high. And that's what really drives the bilateral adrenal hyperplasia in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, so in that case, you supplement those patients with cortisol, and eventually your ACTH should come back down to normal. So dexamethasone is a, is a, a drug that's an immunosuppressant, but it's also used diagnostically. Um, it has a long half-life, and it is more potent than cortisol, so 10 to 20 times the potency of, of cortisol, including the negative feedback. 
And so the, the dexamethasone suppression tests work by giving dexamethasone, and you're expecting to see an effect on cortisol in circulation. So the expected effect is you give dexamethasone, you expect to see a decrease in cortisol. That's the normal response. If you don't see that decrease, then you're thinking about Cushing's. And so we have several different versions. Um, the, the first version is the overnight, and really I think about that as a rule-out test. You can rule out Cushing's disease, but you can't really rule in Cushing's disease. So it's a, a simple test, and we'll give you a few more details on that. The low dose is uh, several different uh, administrations of, of cortisol, and really what you're looking for there is the ability to rule in. So um, if you fail to suppress on a low dose, then you rule someone in as Cushing's, and then you need to figure out what is the cause. The high dose can help determine etiology. And so what happens with the high dose is that you give eight milligrams of dexamethasone a day for several days. There's a, there's a few different uh, versions of the test. And essentially, if you give that much uh, dexamethasone, it actually feeds back on Cushing's disease. So it actually has an effect on the pituitary and Cushing's disease to suppress ACTH, and you get a decrease in cortisol. So um, that helps figure out etiology. Cushing's disease versus some other Cushing syndrome. So the overnight test, it's one milligram of dexamethasone. We like this version because it can be done as an outpatient. Um, and you measure the cortisol in the morning, and the appropriate response is suppression. So um, you have ruled out Cushing's disease if you get a, a suppression of cortisol, and you're pretty much done. If you fail to suppress, um, then they possibly have Cushing's, but uh, there are false positives with this test, and so it typically gets followed up with uh, another test, and that might be the low dose. Um, it's an overnight test. It's simple. It's an outpatient, um, but the disadvantage is, is that you get false positive. You get failure to suppress. Um, low dose dexamethasone is essentially two milligrams of dexamethasone a day for several days. And again, the appropriate response, you give dexamethasone, you want to see a suppression of cortisol. Um, if you do get a suppression, they're normal and you're done. Um, if you fail to suppress, then they, they have Cushing's. And so at that point, you need, need to figure out, is it an adenoma of the adrenal? Is it an oat cell carcinoma? Is it a pituitary issue? Um, and so that is done by a variety of different techniques that will We'll mention there. Um, so if they don't have a suppression of cortisol to less than 10 micrograms per deciliter, they have Cushing syndrome, and we need to figure out what is the cause. And one way to do that is a high-dose dexamethasone. As we mentioned, a high dose is uh, 8 milligrams of dexamethasone um, for several days, and the, um, you measure the AM cortisol at the end of the test, and you're hoping to see in Cushing's disease, uh, cortisol is suppressed. So um, if you give enough dexamethasone, it actually does have an effect on a pituitary adenoma that's secreting ACTH. That's the definition of Cushing's disease. Uh, however, it does not feed back um, on an adrenal adenoma, and that makes sense because the adrenal adenoma is not being driven by ACTH. Um, it's a, it's a an adenoma that's producing too much cortisol independently of ACTH. Um, or you could have an oat cell carcinoma. The, the oat cell carcinomas don't, are not subject to the negative feedback. And so um, that would be an ectopic production of ACTH. But for the differentiation, there's going to be, uh, you know, surgery and, and, and doing selective venous adrenal sampling, um, complicated and, and requires some uh, surgery skills. Um, but you can actually uh, figure out um, where is the cortisol coming from. Is it coming from the right adrenal or the left adrenal? Um, ACTH stem test. So now we're switching gears and we're talking about hypocortisolism and we're trying to figure out why are they hypocortis why do they have a low cortisol? Um, so you can give an ACTH stem test. That's actually administering ACTH and measuring cortisol. And so if you have a, so cortricin is, uh, is the ACTH, so we're giving the ACTH, we're measuring cortisol, 
if you give a short test uh, and they respond, so you give ACTH, you get a bump in your cortisol, that's the expected response, then uh, it says your adrenals are working. Um, however, if they've been, um, if their ACTH hasn't been stimulating their adrenal for a long time, you might need to give them a longer stimulus of ACTH, and that's the, the long test, um, because your adrenals become hypofunctional if they haven't had any input from ACTH. Um, backing up one more level um, to figure out secondary from tertiary, there's a CRH stem test. So CRH is really the what's coming from the hypothalamus acting on the pituitary. We give CRH and we're measuring cortisol. Um, so it's going to be helpful for figuring out tertiary insufficiency. Um, so you administer AC, or CRH and you measure cortisol, a tertiary insufficiency where you haven't had input into your pituitary, um, you're going to get a, a, a response by you know, supplementing that by an IV dose of, of uh, CRH. So that's a, a quick overview of ACTH, uh, dexamethasone uh, uh, suppression test, and the ACTH and CRH stem test. Thanks for tuning in.